Welcome everybody to a new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast 1991 retrospective series where we are covering albums of note from the incredibly prolific year of 1991, producing several classic albums. And today on this episode, we are going to be talking about Queen's Innuendo. Indeed we are. So, the, so, uh, Queen the long-awaited discussion by no one but me. Queen is opposed to the uh, to the incredibly unprolific year of uh, 1865 BCE, where no good records were released, not one. Fucking pleb ass year. Who? Yeah. So, Queen are a band that obviously need no introduction. Everyone knows who Queen are, but this is the 1991 retrospective. So I wanted to kick this video off by um, asking and answering a question, basically, which is where does Queen's innuendo fit in the narrative of 1991? So why are, we talking about, why are we talking about this in the 1991 retrospective as opposed to in a record club, for instance? Because the 1991 retrospective, as I've kind of tried to make clear as we go on, it's not just about, the, hey, these cool records are turning 30 this month, uh, the 30th mm -hmm. year, which is obviously like a part of it. But the bigger reason why we chose to do this year instead of doing 1981 40 year anniversary or 2001 20 year anniversary series is that 1991 is obviously a hugely important year in general for music, especially mm -hmm. in the development of the music in the alternative world and the crossover of alternative rock music, alternative hip hop music, a lot of alternative forms of music into having their moment in pop in the mainstream world. Um, and in many senses, Innuendo by Queen is maybe the loosest fitting record we discussed to this kind of general narrative. But I wanted to make sure we did do this video because I do think it is important uh, because for all of the artists whose careers burst to life with significant milestone records this year, the artists that either came onto the scene like Massive Attack, the artists who made a momentous leveling up like Nirvana and Soundgarden, the artists who push radically forward like U2 and My Bloody Valentine, the artists who make singular statements before bowing away like Slint, and then there's Queen who have their own capital M moment early in the year, but it represents the culmination and final statement of the band. For as much as 1991 in music is a year about new beginnings, for this band, it was the colossal and epic final curtain call. And this record being the earliest in the whole year that we're discussing, it actually came out early in January, um, is, I think fitting in that way because it's almost like a final goodbye to an earlier era that is subsumed with the new face of alternative music and rock and hip-hop. Though Queen will were and will always remain legends, they are representative of an earlier vastly different era that was fast sweeping away by this point in history. Uh, this is what I think makes this final declarative statement so powerful it's a it's a final bow for both freddie mercury and for the glammy massive hard rock of the 70s and 80s in general for a new era to begin and befitting such a momentous year it really does begin with a party innuendo is undoubtedly a bittersweet album at certain points but it's also fun and it never loses sight of the core desire the band has always imbued to be awe-inspiring and bombastic and magnificently in your face at every turn. Um, Jake, I want to jump to you for first. When you think of Innuendo and how it sits in relation to other Queen records and at this point in their career, what do you make of it? Well, I am pretty much the podcast's uh, most outspoken Queen fan. I know Morgan is also a, a bit of a fan himself, but probably not the, to the degree that I am. And, you know, you say that Queen are a band that need no introduction. And to most degrees, you are correct. 
but they are often thought as being a singles band by most people. You get exposed to them through their incredibly popular singles, like the collaboration with David Bowie, Under Pressure. You hear about Bohemian Rhapsody, all kinds of shit. And it's just like, they are so in the popular consciousness and people like Freddie Mercury are their, their icons. So, you know, culturally speaking, it's impossible not to know who Queen are, but when you really dig into their work, that's what I think makes them so fascinating as a band and as a project that I think that they're so much bigger and have so much more to them than just being the band who made Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, and it's interesting because their start was not emblematic of what they would be known for. You have their first two records, which are the self-titled and Queen 2, which are, for my money, at least two of their best albums, but they are very much blends of their brand of arena stadium rock with some progressive elements. You have something like Queen 1, which is a bit more hard rock influence, but Queen 2 is this progressive fantasy epic thing that takes as much from Rush as it does Led Zeppelin. Uh, and then you move into something like Sheer Heart Attack, which is a little bit more about punch and impact. And you're going to songs that have a, just a bit more uh, grit to them. And you go into something more ornate, like A Night at the Opera and sort of Day at the Races, News of the World, Jazz and the Game are sort of their peak arena rock stadium period. Uh, and that's when they basically caught on to the mainstream for what time they had in it. And they did things like the Flash Gordon soundtrack. They did albums like The Work. A Kind of Magic, which has tons of soundtrack songs on it. Um, other sort of lesser known and in all honesty, lesser albums like Hot Space and uh, The Miracle, which have their highlights in my opinion, but are just sort of, the band has pushed themselves into so many different corners and it's sort of inevitable that they would make lots of albums that would feel ultimately very transitional. And those are ones, but Innuendo here is the penultimate Queen record because uh, Made in Heaven, uh, their final album, as it would imply, is only technically half finished because Freddie Mercury, of course, notably did die of AIDS and they were in the process of recording it upon his death and uh, just something to note about it is that Freddie hid the fact that he had AIDS for years and years and years before it was known to the public. In fact, Innuendo is an album that was recorded in the throes of it. And in those final days when he was doing Made in Heaven, Freddie was on death's door and he goes in and delivers some of his most insanely awe-inspiring performances on albums like Innuendo and Made in Heaven. They would literally wheelchair him into the studio and he would belt out like he never had before. Uh, notably, go listen to the song, um, Oh Hell. There's this, just go listen to um, Made in Heaven and there's a song on there. I think it's, it might actually just be called Mama that's got some of his best vocal work. But I think Innuendo is sort of the album that was the beginning of the end for Queen as a band. The sort of, it sort of epitomizes every single sound that they tried their hand at um, in their early career to all the way up to where they were. And it was one of the, it was the last project Freddie was fully involved with and got to put himself into completely. And so as a result, you have this really interesting blend of arena stadium rock, uh, their most progressive album, in my opinion. They have lots of tendencies to sort of play to that sort of 70s and even 80s era rush in places and also some slower and not quite experimental, but just sort of interesting and weird places to take their tracks like the opener um and yeah. as a result it's sort of this it's sort of the perfect not a final album but kind of the perfect final album and a result this is the the show this is the the final performance before the curtain finally gets drawn and as a result it's a very opulent very big very bright record features some of the band's best performances and i love almost every song on here uh, with all of my being. Um, one notable exception, I, I guarantee you all know the song that I'm talking about, but I'll we'll get to shove it. that aside to later. Yeah, um, um, but I, I do think this is my favorite Queen album. I'd say it's probably not the 
best. I think that belongs to Queen too. I think that's the most cohesive artistic statement they have that sort of blends all of their proclivities together. But Innuendo has been an album that's sort of I've latched onto just because of its weird idiosyncrasies and its energy. And it's just very underrated in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sheer Heart Attack hits the edge for me. But mm. um, what, what I find so interesting about this album and, and really digging into it recently and reinforced my um, belief that this should be a record we cover in this um, series as the um, tone of it emotionally is interesting because it's kind of all over the place tonally but that's a perfect reflection of, of yeah. who Queen are right uh, and so there's this interesting quality to it where as you've said Freddie did not want the public to know that he was ill certainly didn't want them to know that he had AIDS um, mm-hmm. and that he was dying and so there was this co- constant consistent um and intention and effort to keep up the facade of, of normalcy. But at the same time, Freddie does let his state of mind, uh, Freddie does let his condition and his obvious ponderings on mortality leak into the songwriting that he's doing. And it's all over this record. And I think what's the best and, and most interesting place to kick off with this record. I mean, I think basically everything you need to know about this record is in the first two songs, but then beyond ah, perfect. I was going to say exactly that. But then beyond that, you still get plenty more essential stuff as well. But I think it's worth digging off straight away with the title track. Um, it has it starts off with these ominous sweeping synths and then explodes into a halftime romp. Notable for a number of reasons. It is Queen's longest single ever, mm-hmm. uh, even longer than Bohemian Rhapsody. It was also, this is I think even more important, this was their first UK number one in 10 years at the time. It wow, came I did not know that. The previous oh. UK number one was Under Pressure in 1981. They had not had a number one in their home country for 10 years. And then this song, of all songs, this song was the single they chose to lead the record with. I believe this was the lead single, but this was the song that, that got them to number one again. So what's interesting about this record is not just that it happened to be the last record that the whole band completed before Freddie's death, but that even before anyone in the public eye knew that Freddie was dying, before that could be a part of the band's narrative, it still produced their most successful music in a decade. And so you can take away any of that oh people are just like and like this record or they're extra nice this record because it was freddie's last album you can take that shit away because this record was already making waves that were big for queen at this time in their career uh well before people knew the state of things the true state of things and the fact that innuendo the song is it was as successful as it is i think is doubly impressive considering that it is the most proggy song they had put out in over mm-hmm. a decade at that point it calls back to yep. their 70s stuff in a big way it fuses a hard rock sound that's very familiar to queen fans that is reminiscent of their earliest records with also that sweeping bombast that they first kind mm-hmm. of fully embraced on uh, night at the opera and then came to define a lot of their later 70s stuff powerhouse vocals from freddie there's classic lines of we'll keep on trying we'll tread that fine line until the end of time um, and then this, uh, uh, also my favorite aspect of the song, yeah. not going to surprise anyone, is the fact that the midsection of the song has a flamenco guitar, which uh-huh. is provided by none other than Steve Howe of Yes. Um, <laughs> yep. That's right. Sweet. Steve Howe, the uh, guitarist, the electric uh, acoustic guitarist and flamenco guitarist who played on Yes's classic albums, Fragile, all of that, is the one single uh, musician who is not in Queen who was allowed to play on a Queen studio recording during their tenure as a band and their tenure as a band from the 1971 to 1991 the only I believe if I'm to trust Wikipedia at least the only uh, outside musician who plays prominently on a Queen out studio record at all so that's a really interesting inclusion for one um, and I think if you're going to do this, which is what Queen are trying to do with it, seem people want to do with this track, which is to create a proggy epic song that has mm-hmm. also got radio hit potential. Uh, the proggy element, the, a great way to infuse that proggy element without, in, in, without alienating modern audiences is to bring in someone like Steve Howe, who plays so tastefully, who plays mm-hmm. so beautifully on this song. 
Uh, his collab- his contri- contributions basically steal the show while he's in the song in that midsection. Uh, the song also prominently features a Korg M1 synth, which is a classic synthesizer that's all over this record too. Sounds great, enhances the bombastic feel of a lot of this music, which again, if you're just a general listener of Queen, which I admittedly am, um, then it might not seem like such a shock. But like to consider this record in the context of their career at this point, it is quite a shocking record. Um, so yeah, and this song is also topically uh, really ambitious too. It's this sweeping epic about the human condition, basically, uh, the great flaws of mankind, how they perpetuate themselves again and again, but yet how we barrel through them relentlessly. It neatly epitomizes where Freddie and the band were at this point too, an uncertain future and a painful, pessimistic present but fighting through all of that regardless. It's an energy of persistence and of resilience that I think encapsulates and epitomizes obviously Queen as a whole, but specifically the tone of this record. And uh, something that does need to be said about Steve Howe in particular is that uh, his band Asia was catching its second wind early in the 90s. So obviously this was a very... Yeah. topical inclusion in the song yeah absolutely good point i had forgotten about asia but you're right yeah i uh, also with big like album point. aqua was released the following year and that's where they really and that of course comes after a 1990 compilation album of like their greatest hits so it's it's a really it's another really interesting way this album fits into the grander narrative of pop music yeah right because i was just thinking like oh queen have brought in this prog legend to spice up the song but no it's actually more a part of their pop instincts than their prog instincts it's 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 a really smart commercial decision and it's the the landscape was sort of built for it in a lot of ways and i'm sort of like I guess contextual, if you go and knowing nothing about the band, then it might be a little bit jarring in some respect, just because it's like, it does have that sort of single potential, but it's also just infused with such uh, singularity, I guess. But something I also want to mention is that sort of Queen is a band, uh, you know, not to obviously diminish Freddie Mercury, who is frequently cited as the greatest vocalist of all time. And I mean, like, I'm not gonna fucking argue that. You fucking listen to like any Queen album. It's like it's the proof is there. It's in the pudding. Fucking eat it. Um, that said, uh, cannot stress this enough. Brian May, one of the greatest guitarists of all time. IMO, and I think this album is a fucking amazing showcase of his talents. His soloing and just general work, I think, is absolutely fucking fantastic on songs like Headlong, the title track, fucking The Hitman, or on songs like The Show Must Go On or Baiju. It's fucking, ooh, and, it's, and it's really good. He's the and exact it, reason why Sheer Heart Attack is my favorite Queen album. Mm-hmm. In terms, it's in terms of, him. of uh, yeah, Brian May, if you look at, I think, his actual writing credits to this album, he's writing a lot of the hard rock songs on mm-hmm. this album, the more progressive leaning songs. And I think that really speaks to his place in the band as being really the fire in their ass, so to yeah. speak. Well, mm-hmm. Headlong, I believe, Headlong and I Can't Live With You were both written by May uh, and intended as solo songs for his work. But then he decided they would work better for Queen. And I have to say that I think that was a very smart decision because Freddie's vocals infuse those specific songs with so much character and soul mm-hmm. that it's frankly difficult to imagine them being anywhere near as good as they are with anyone else singing them. Um, they round, round out a run of four songs on side A that I think stands as one of the best sequences on any Queen record that I've heard. Um, and I've kind of skipped over uh, I'm Going Slightly Mad, which is another quite important song yes. um, to the record as well. Uh, it's this, um, as the title would suggest, it's one of the record's darker tracks with these ominous and even kind of cheesy electronic sounds throughout, but also a consistent... I, I love the opening fucking synth passage in yeah. this song. It's so fucking dark. Uh, I, I, I unabashedly love it too. Burdum, burdum. But it it also has that consistently chugging beat as well, propelling you through its weird, barren soundscapes. 
what this description of it though misses is also how funny the song is. Mm -hmm. uh, it has some of the record's weirdest and most British lyrics. Uh, <laughs> plenty of references to Noel Coward that manifest in uh, a lot of iconic, bizarro lines. Uh, my The most perhaps jarring of which being, I'm feeling like a banana tree. Um, Fucking... Oh, I love I love Freddie's delivery on here. Just the, like the I'm going slightly mad. It's just it's such a perfect encapsulation of the appeal of the song and just the yeah. way he and sings that really fucking like strangely like languid melody. It's so fucking yeah. weird. And it's it's also great because it's an a, a great example of how Freddie can use music to take his bleak and dire situation and infuse it with a kind of camp humor and uh, that's this with. entire album for me is that that's what all of this reads as is that it's just like it's him wanting to go out with a bang it's also yeah. him wanting to like it's sort of like you knew that he knew the end was on the horizon so it's just like all right it's time to do everything yeah, it's, <laughs> that time they do. That, it's time to take that kind of dark world i'm living in and just be silly with it that's where the title comes from i think that's yeah. what the innuendo is is that we all mm -hmm. now, especially in retrospect, and Freddie at the time, and the band, we know what this is about, right? But we're not like specifically mentioning it. We're just dancing around it and having fun. Um, and, and that's what leads to, I think, some of the most classic songs on this record. Uh, and, and, and the real emotional variety in the tone of this record is, is one of the great joys of it. There's a mm -hmm. real, it's like you have all this fun, weirdo shit like you get this really dark song like i'm going slightly mad that's also kind of like really um you know dark and funny and kooky and weird and 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 camp but you also have genuine sadness in a track like uh these are the days of our lives for instance great which, song which i think is one of the most plainly pretty and lush queen songs that i've heard um but also to the band's credit, uh, the exact emotional tone, as I said, is not really consistent across the album. It's more a broad range of feelings that see the band trying to master all shades of their sound one final time, or at least uh, with the attitude that it could be the end, it could be the last time. So yeah. what do you all think of the emotional tone of this album and the variation in tone and feeling across the record? I guess for myself, while I while I do get behind the like why the inconsistency in the emotional tone is there, I can't say it made for the most enjoyable listening experience for me. Like I found myself a little lost tonally at points. Like uh, there's one particular that one in particular that yeah I'm going slightly mad into headlong where it was just like what the fuck, huh? where i i found myself a little yeah. confused Fucking and complete opposites yeah and and that didn't quite sit well for me i mean and as you have made the point of a bit of the that putting a fine putting a final page on it closing the book is is important to what innuendo is it just doesn't quite sit well for me as like an actual album. Oh, that, that doesn't surprise me. I definitely think this record has, has flaws. I even think it has moments that don't feel as fully committed to the bit as other moments on this record. But I've come to enjoy a lot of the tracks towards the middle of this record more the more time I spend with them. And just the more that I think of them in this kind of really camp way, like um, for instance, Ride the Wild Wind, which I mm. think is an unabashedly silly song. Um, it, it is just really pomp and and and, and like the 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 um, you know the mo the engine roar sounds and like the the yep. solo is really kind of like over the top and gratuitous and and the whole feeling of the track is really kind of like it might have been meatloaf actually but this is all like positive stuff in this instance mm -hmm. like it just gave me gave me that kind of feeling that I want to get from that sort of really theatrical camp stuff but equally there are other moments on this record that try to do a similar thing or try to capture a similar sense of irreverence and don't really work i think the hitman unfortunately is one another example of a song that yeah, i appreciate the attitude and the, the fun the you know the irreverence of it but it, it doesn't really land in that instance um i but, would say most of that for me was in the back half of the album where that 
particularly started to annoy me more than the first half Hearing because in hit the man slander not <laughs> I can't I can't do this. I, can't I swear hit like it's it's a hit man slander. Oh no. Yeah, because I'm the only one who gets to be upset about it. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm very, the only person who gives a shit. It's not a it's not I don't think it's a bad song. It's very fun. It's very silly. Um I do think they execute that kind of irreverence a bit better earlier in the album. Um like again, I like I kind of alluded to, it's a very cheesy song, but I will go to bat hard for I can't live with you. I love oh, that yeah. song. Uh, that song is like, it's it's cool, really kind of pretty corny as hell, but I just really dig it. Uh, I just, I think the hook is so strong in that song and uh, it feels like classic Queen, like classic oh, yeah. Queen, like great there. at this point in their career. I just I dig that song so much. Yeah, and I think for the very same reason i mean like it doesn't surprise me at all like this is exactly what i predicted opinion wise is that it's just like the mania of the album has always been its core appeal to me and i i guess maybe when i listened to queen's discography in order it was just so refreshing to hear the refinements of their sound and also just like a in spirit the album it reminds me a lot of is the final for now Tom Waits album Bad Is Me which is an album that very clearly is like Tom Waits basically designing a greatest hits of Tom Waits album but they they consist of not old songs but new ones where he just like tries to cover all of his bases of what everyone likes about him and that's sort of the deal with here and I, I feel like I'm able to appreciate it a bit more contextually but I also just there's so few albums that get to indulge in their irreverence and, and silliness in a way that I also find musically compelling because a lot of the time I feel like a lot of bands trade one way too heavily for the other and it either just one of them falls flat or the or one of them is just way too overbearing and it just doesn't work for me. But this here, I think the, the blending of both sides works Except when it when it does not on yeah. uh, one particular song that I'll just go I I look I I nobody knows better than me I am going to to come to bat to defend Queen from from any and all slander because I think they're a terrific band and I love them and most of what uh, makes Queen great other than the raw musicianship and talent of the people playing is as Tyler said camp it's it's all theatrical it's all a show it's all about how much you engage with that particular brand of artifice. And for me anyway, this is what leads me to not like albums that are considered bona fide classics like A Night at the Opera, which I think is like, I won't even lie. I think that album's kind of bad, but like they, they, they just didn't really know how to do it then. And then here they kind of also forget how to do it on the song Delilah, which like, I get it. It's 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 cute, but it also kind of sucks. <laughs> it's, it it just doesn't like. It sounds so dated and cheesy, and the lyrics are just so simple. There's no bombast here that's supposed that, to be like, yeah. oh yeah, it's got this problem. Like nothing about the album that is great to me is emblematic of Delilah as a song. Like there's just no like lyrically, you don't have to be the best thing in the world, but also it's just like the cheap sounding synthesizers that just like. They kind of work on other songs. They don't work here. And the very simple songwriting is just, eh. What kills me about Delilah is just the, like, annoying sound effects scattered about yeah. it. Which the is, um, talk box guitar made to sound like a cat meowing. Is uh, like, Legitimately, every single time I've listened to that album, I have burst out laughing when that happens. Really? It is fucking, it is the funniest fucking thing i've ever heard maybe ever heard <laughs> on an album it is ridiculously <laughs> stupid and i also like it, it's almost so bad that it almost like goes full circle into being like enjoyably yeah. bad but it's just that moment the rest of the song is like come on man like yeah exactly I get you like, love your cat right uh, and i think the sentiment of the song and the irreverence of it I've been this kind of like playful, silly song about how much he loves his cat. Like he has 11 cats at this time. And mm -hmm. this is one particular cat that he really loves, Delilah, who's like a real mischievous cat. 
Um, I, I think the conceit and the idea of the song is something that could have been made into a genuinely funny piece of music. Um, but the, a lot of the decisions just kind of fall flat. Um, the mm-hmm. meows that Freddie adds himself, I think if that's Freddie on it, but it might be yeah, like it the trailer. Um, but anyway, the meows are themselves are just like, come on, they're just too, they, they cross a certain line of silliness where it starts to go against the kind of like cheery vibe you're kind of cre- trying to create. I, I would like to point out as well, but again, I can't, I'm not mad at Freddie for this. I, I can't really no. get mad at any song on this album, even this song. I'm not, I mean, like, I don't hate this song. I just think it's I mean, not I, good. I, I, I think it's pretty bad, but I'm not like mad at yeah, it. It's bad. I, I, I kind of get it. But I do, and also the other reason I'm not mad at it is because it is just so consistently hilarious. Um, and I think it is intentional. I think it's intentionally yeah. hilarious. Um, for instance, I also double over laughing at the level of stank that Freddie puts on lines like, you make me slightly mad when you pee all over my Chippendale suit. <laughs> Which is like a delightful insight into, into Freddie's world. But also a, a, also a line where he's kind of undercutting himself a little bit there as well. And I, I dig that. I dig that sentiment. It's just the idea doesn't come um, really well together musically as well. Um, no, it doesn't. I, I don't want to spend like too much time on this particular song because it's really a no. Um and, Yes. And I, don't want to, I don't want my own hesitations with this record relative to some of my favorite Queen records to be overstated either. I think this is a, this is a 12 track album that has eight songs that were called genuinely great, which is a pretty fucking good batting average. Um, and I think uh, it has to be said that the record um, comes to a close. Once you've gotten through some of those sillier moments, the record kind of hits home and nails that real final stretch beautifully. I do want, I know Jake's already touched on this, but I think that Bijou has a really nice, uh, really mm-hmm. spacious interlude that I think is very well placed. You can't really go from a song like the Hitman into the closing track of this record. You need to have some kind of um, bridge there. I think Bijou does it really nicely. And, and yeah, that's also kind of all I feel Bijou does for me in that it's not a song I particularly care for. Fair enough. Fair I think enough. it's it, it just feels like an interlude and I can't get past that with it. Okay, well, look, I, I, well, fair enough. Uh, it is just an interlude to me, but like that to me, yeah. I think is, is uh, positive because I think the record needs something like that at this point. Okay, okay. Um, but then you go into um, yeah. the closing track. Few no, musicians, I think, have had um, a chance to end their career official uh, as massively as Freddie Mercury does with The Show Must Go On. Obviously not uh, intended to be oh. the end because he obviously did. He kept coming into the booth and <laughs> spitting fire in the booth right up until his dying day. In fact, mm-hmm. I believe specifically he said that he was going to um, continue uh, recording music and I quote, till I fucking drop. And you and definitely get that did. attitude. You get that attitude all throughout this. And the show must go on it is obviously a no holds barred, balls to the wall power ballad that frankly deserves to be much bigger culturally than it is. I, I genuinely and wholeheartedly believe that the show must go on is the greatest Queen song. It's a very understandable. Yeah, this... It's certainly the ultimate Queen song at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very no, it 80s, admittedly. It's very 80s, admittedly, in the sound, but also it kind mm. of transcends time and stands alone as this kind of totemic achievement for the band and for this performer as well. I, it's kind of difficult to do anything but be in awe of it um, yeah. whenever I'm listening to it. Th- this song locally. is powerful. It is huge. Yeah, it is absolutely gigantic. And the... Uh, I think really what it speaks to mostly, uh, most of all, is is Freddie Mercury's uh, re- absolutely unabashed and unflinching commitment to performance. And you can yes. get a real sense of the fact that he knows that his days are numbered and really that all this does is rally him further to perform even harder, to push through his illness with even more kind of voracious uh, intensity. Uh, and that is 
uh, one of the most attractive aspects of this whole record. And I think also his desire for his illness not to become a part of the narrative, mm -hmm. but also to try and not hide himself away as well, to try and present himself is reflected in the music videos that were made um, for this record. Um, and, and much talk has been um, said about them. And specifically, I think the last one that was shot was These Are The Days Of Our Lives, where you can see visibly, even though Freddie is kind of um, in the dark and, and not um, lit particularly well for the exact reason of wanting to disguise his illness, you can see that he's become a kind of gaunt and frail mm -hmm. figure, uh, despite the fact that he's, his postures and his uh, physicality, he's still trying to put his absolutely everything into that. Um, there's even also a video that I haven't seen, but I've read about for I'm going slightly mad too, I believe, where you, where Freddie is a, 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 playing along with the irreverence of that song and dressing up and stuff and, and doing absolutely everything within his power to completely override um, the, any kind of perception of, of unwellness, any kind of perception of winding down. Uh, and that is, it, it's an, it really, it results in a record and in songs that um, even at their cheesiest, it's almost listening to this record is such an emotional experience because yeah. of the knowledge of how much effort is going into it and how much, and it's not just a case of like, you know, a record's good, because we should say a record's good because there was a lot of visible effort put into it. But it's the fact yeah. that um, in spite of everything, it sounds and feels and has the energy that is as compelling as it is. Uh, is, is just so genuinely impressive. Yeah, The Show Must Go On for me is just a perfect emblem of who Queen are and what their mission statement is, is to sort of give you an escape from the dark, harsh reality of the world and sort of play up that theatricality and the way it blends like the genuine emotion, but also the emotional bombast. Like, you know, you hear him say, like genuinely, this is the song where it's like, you know, I definitely enjoy a, a whole lot of cheesy music and whatnot. And I don't really think this even veers into that, but it's like when he says, uh, uh, my heart may be breaking, my makeup may be flaking, but my smile still carries on. I'm like, oh, Oh, okay. I'm go I'm I'm going to cry now. Like it's just such a fucking like it's so emblematic of who he was too. Just like Freddie just being this overpowering icon of music, of sexuality, of of all of these things of camp and it's him saying that it's just like no, this is this is who I am. I'm going to keep fighting and the song is just so like anthemic and it's just it's the moment for the band where it's just like an encapsulation of this is why we do what we do and this is why music like this exists and it's just so perfect in all of that it, it also like that song also like the whole tonality a lot of the lyrics you've set, you've cited and the just the feel and the performance of the song uh, it, it has that kind of like um a camp i guess is the most appropriate word but it's also kind of like a distinctly queer energy as well that mm -hmm. really imbues in a lot of his performance as well. And it, it's understandable to see why this track has become kind of such an anthem for all of the things that it is obviously about. And mm -hmm. it, it's just um, really genuinely life affirming, but also like not self serious either. Like that's no. the thing. That's what's so beautifully unique and, and fun about Queen is the fact that they could be, have this kind of like pomposity and genuine like hugeness and and uh, melodrama to a lot of what they're communicating emotionally and the sentiments, but it's also like not self-serious and it's also like not like tortured. It's just like unabashedly bombastic and like over the top in every way. And, and I definitely think that I appreciate that more now than maybe I would have when I was younger. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly glad that we get a chance to talk about in the context of this retrospective because when you're kind of moving into a, a postmodern age uh, as the 90s came to be and culturally so much of it was tied in like postmodern art and a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about in our 991 retrospective kind of folds into that movement this is like a refreshing blast of, of, mm -hmm. of an earlier time um continuing and transcending and um you know pursuing itself into um the modern world and and that's also what's so special about it 
I, I think that you nailed something really important here about innuendo is that like for all of its mania and its camp and its theatricality and even like its, you know, tonal inconsistency is that the reason it gets by with me too is that it's just like, again, even on Delilah, it's just like, it's just so sincere. Like, yes, there's a level of, of artifice to it. And yes, there's a level of performance to it that's very, very intentional, but it never comes from a place that's disingenuous. It's honest, it's raw, and it's using these tools, this particular brand of music artifice to be able to display that. And I think Innuendo is the most impressive Queen album in that regard, is that it manages to blend that honesty and that camp without being like it's like it's compromising one for the other. And it's sort of epitomized by those great songs, songs like Innuendo and songs like Show Must Go On, where it's just so fucking like enrapturing and powerful but it's also just a fun album it's like it's it's it feels defiantly fun it feels like fun in spite of everything bad in the world and that's why queen is a great band is that i think that they just sort of have that at the heart of all of their albums is you know no matter how grand or how cheesy or whatever they get is that they never don't mean it and that's why it's fucking awesome like you hear something on like queen 2 and it's this huge sprawling fantasy narrative that's this story that freddie mercury was actually writing a, a fantasy novel that never saw the light of day that got turned into that album and i'm gonna be forever pissed about that because i totally want to hear i want to read a freddie Merc mercury fantasy novel just because that sounds like it would smack but you hear that and it's just like this story that's got all these like tolkien inspirations and all these things and it's just like but the conviction of the performances and uh, and the language and the prose and it's just it's so captivating and I just I know that Queen is a band you know you have all these singles for it's but like I feel like if, if so many people would just give them a bit more of a chance who people who like this kind of stuff like I do they would get so much more out of this and I feel like innuendo is the epitome of all of that a absolutely um yeah yeah, yeah. All right. Um, anything else that anyone wants to add? Uh, I mean, maybe just a, a quick yeah. final aside on my part in that I think I, I've come off more negative on this album than I, I really am in that I do, I do like, I, I'd say a good about half of it I enjoy and the other half I find a little scattershot. But I, what I think, it, what for me queen represents is they just for me at least they are not like i guess my kind of brand of of camp and and cheese and humor but i i feel this discussion made me appreciate a lot more of what they do and what they're going for in general and it, it makes me look back on this album in a way a bit different than I, I think I had before. And I think it's it's a very interesting, worthy addition to the catalog of, of 1991. And I also wanted to add the addendum that I, I think what Queen did as being this last kind of vestige of the 80s and, and this glam sound was in an interesting way kind of carried on in the traditions of progressive metal and in bands like Dream Theater, mm -hmm. where they just took these ideas but evolved them for a modern audience. And I think that's that's something very interesting to where this album fits in culturally. Yeah. Right on the money. I completely even agree. Like what, even what like what Faith No More were doing at the exact time. Yeah, yeah. Mike Patton in general just kind of has that sort of spirit about his music, you know? Yeah, like like I, I see a, a kindredness in some respects between this record and a record like The Real Thing by Faith No More. Um, it's just, and, and a lot of, for a lot of the reasons that um, that August has kind of pinned that with the Dream Theater comparison and that can, evolving tradition of like progressive metal and, and, and weirdo, progressive music and throughout the 90s and onwards is a really great um, comparison point that's so like us that I wouldn't have ever thought to make so yeah I'm glad you brought that up that's I'll be thinking about that for a few days probably yep all right I would also just recommend that Tyler 
listen to Queen One and Queen Two. I, I, I heard the maybe... first two. Oh, what you have? Yeah, I, I, okay, I, 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 I'm a bit average on the first one, but I really, really yeah, most people are really, really like uh, Queen Two. I've heard, um, I've heard like, I've heard the first four Queen albums in full, um, and I've mm-hmm. heard um, uh, large sections of the subsequent seventies records as well. I familiarize myself with a lot with basically your entire career uh, leading up to this but I um, obviously didn't have time to listen to many records yeah. But, but yeah well, uh, Day at the Races and News of the World are definitely two albums you should check out because I feel like they're in that sort of same vein as Sheer Heart Attack so you might really gravitate towards those two. I, I definitely intend to finish out their classic run like the, all their 70s records at least because yep. um, I know there's so many great songs I already love on them because they're just so um, you know uh, it whatever the word is for when such song is basically everywhere, um, that. Uh, omnipresent. Omnipresent. Wow, we fucking... <laughs> and also, August, on the note of camp, you really should listen to the music of Meatloaf. I think you'd really dig it. I think yeah. you'd bat out specifically. I think you'd really dig Because it's like... Right. But also the songwriting is really, like, extra and awesome. And, like, <laughs> the arrangements on those records are very proggy. And like cool and all over the place and it's just like it's so I, I, you'd really dig it i think you'd give it you'd slap bad out of how with a hard seven i already know that but you would enjoy the hell out of it it would be a very enjoyable all right for you. um anyway no that's, i will make a yeah. note of it anyway um okay so favorite yeah. tracks and ratings for queen's innuendo i'm also i'll kick us off i guess my three favorite tracks are Innuendo, uh, I'm Going Slightly Mad, and The Show Must Go On. Really basic picks, I know. And I just... Look. <laughs> um, uh, least favorite track is, is uh, Delilah, evidently. Uh, I'm going to give this record a 7.5. All right. For myself, I would say uh, The Show Must Go On, I'm Going Slightly Mad, and These Are The Days. Um, least favorite would yeah have to be delilah i would give it a six well favorite obviously kind of gave the bag away but show must go on best queen song i am oh uh so that's at the top i'm gonna throw some love for the hitman just because i think the guitar work on that song is fucking gnarly and it rips my fucking balls off i love that shit uh and i will say the title track uh innuendo uh, fantastic i give the album a nine out of ten okay so and morgan and sersha who are not here have both given it an 8.5 as well mm, so love that, to see it that gives it an average of 7.9 mm. uh, other records that we've given a 7.9 average include mike oldfield's tubular bells um the devon townsend projects addicted uh, i think yeah most poignantly of the other 7.9s Yep, uh, Between the Buried and Me's Colors as well, uh, and the recent Arm and Hammer record too, we've got a 7.9 average. And also Saturday Night Wrist by Deftones. <laughs> yeah, that too. Like, honest to God, um, Between the Buried and Me and Devin Townsend being tied is so fucking like, because those are bands that definitely owe their theatrical sense to Queen. Like, you know, Devin's got Ziltoid and Between the Buried and Me have like tons of weird fucking shit that's exactly like shit that's on innuendo, like the spirit, like that's an example of August talking about how the spirit of progressive rock sort of got continued by this. So I think that's actually, that's a fascinating connection yeah. that you made there. It's totally there and I didn't see before. Colors Addicted and this record are both records where it's like the eccentricity and silliness of them is both deeply, obsessively appreciated by some of us and mm-hmm. appreciated but more uh, measured from other people. So I think, yeah. That, oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that captures a, a nice uh, dynamic of the podcast. Um, and yeah, so let us know, at, at, to our viewers at home, let us know in the comments below what you think of Innuendo. What's your favorite Queen album? What does this record mean to you? Uh, what do you think of its significance in the context of 1991 and beyond? Uh, I believe the next uh, record in our retrospective that we're going to be touching on is a record I'm very excited to talk about, De La Soul's album, De La Soul is Dead. Um, so mm. stick around for that. We have already covered 
three previous albums in our retrospective. We covered Massive Attacks, Blue Lines. We covered Slint's Spiderland, and we covered REM's Out of Time. So the retrospective is going to continue moving forward uh, for the next few weeks and then later in the year as well. So stick around for future editions. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the episode. As always, everyone, uh, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Clorox. We make every day better. Every day.